Okay, hi. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Deborah Riddle. I'm the Senior Community Affairs Specialist at Children's Institute. Welcome. And thank you so much for joining us today for our vaccine town hall. Uh, this is in partnership with Cedar sinai So today's town hall will be conducted in English, but it will also be interpreted in Spanish. My colleague, Ali, is going to offer the instructions to access the Spanish interpretation now. Ali, it's all yours. Thank you, Deborah. Buenas tardes. Gracias a todos por acompañarnos hoy. Si desea escuchar la sesión en español, por favor seleccione el icono del globo en la parte de abajo de la pantalla que dice interpretación y selección español. Si tiene alguna pregunta, mándenos un mensaje por chat at Children's Institute. Thank you, Ali. So we're very excited to be here today and uh, share information about the COVID-19 vaccines and answer all of your questions. Um, let me note too, we're also excited to give away some target cards to three very lucky community, uh, um, community winners after our uh, question and answer period. Uh, these target cards are for our community guests. And so if we happen to pull a name uh, of a CII employee, please let us know so that we can redraw and pull for a community member. Before we get started, I did want to let everyone know that we're recording this session. So let's start. I'd like to introduce our guest physician, Dr. Karen Yumbi from Cedar sinai Dr. Yumbi, thank you so much for being here today. Dr. Yumbi is the Associate Director for the Outpatient Pharmacy and Pharmacy Regulatory Surveillance at Cedar sinai Medical, sinai Medical Center. You can read her full bio on this slide. So to get started, I'm going to ask Dr. Yumbi a handful of frequently asked questions, and then we'll save plenty of time for all of your um, audience questions. We'll also share on how and where you can get the vaccine. But first, we're going to take a quick poll and check in to see how you're feeling about the vaccine right now. Okay, I'll just go ahead and read some of the questions. You can read along and go ahead and log in your answers. So question number one, how likely are you to get the COVID-19 vaccine? Uh, first answer, I already got it. Second choice is I am probably getting it. I just have a few more questions first. Our next answer is I'm not quite sure. I'm still deciding. Uh, the next uh, answer is, it's unlikely I will get the vaccine. And finally, I'm not getting the vaccine. Go ahead and, and pick your answer. Uh, question number two, if you have a child who is 12 to 18 years old, how likely are you to get them vaccinated for COVID-19? Uh, answer number one, I'm highly likely. Number two, somewhat likely. Number three, unlikely. And number four, definitely not planning to get the vaccine for my child. Um, number five, I haven't decided yet. And uh, number six, this question does not apply to me. Please check off and we will get uh, the results at the end of this poll. Okay, let's go to question number one. Uh, how likely are you to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I already got it is the top polling answer. 64% of you said that you've already gotten the vaccine, followed by, you just have a few more questions. Question number two, if you have a child who is 12 to 18 years of age, how likely are you to get them vaccinated for COVID-19? 27% of you, the highest polling answer is, oh, no, there's a tie. So 27% of you say that it's highly likely that you'll get your children vaccinated, followed by, well, not followed by, but tied with, this does not apply to you. Uh, the second place answer for, with 18% is you are somewhat likely. 
uh, 18% also, we haven't decided, 9% unlikely, and we have 0% saying definitely not planning. Thank you so much for taking part in this poll. Okay. Um, so why don't we get started with uh, the handful of the most frequently asked questions um, for um, uh, regarding vaccines, COVID-19 vaccines. So we'll start the conversation now with Dr. Yundi. First question, how do we know uh, that the vaccines are safe when it seems that they were developed so quickly? Thanks everybody for having me back and I'm hoping you can all hear me okay. Um, it's a great question to ask, and um, you know I, I have to admit, even myself earlier on, I had that same question. I mean, usually vaccines take decades to be developed, but I quickly, you know, learned that because this was a pandemic, they did things a little bit differently, but they did not compromise safety. So normally, when a vaccine or any medication is developed. Um, they wait for um, the trials to be completed, for the approval from the FDA to be obtained before they start, you know, putting in place all the manufacturing processes. So having the facilities where the medications are made, put together. Because of the pandemic, they realized that they needed to do things at the same time. So instead of waiting for, to, for, to get all to all these steps and then start making the vaccines, they started putting in place the manufacturing plants, the facility needed to make the vaccine so that as soon as it was ready, they would start making a vaccine. So it, they didn't cut corners with safety or effectiveness. They just made sure that they were ready to go as soon as they had good data to show that they can be made. So that's how we got the vaccine here quickly. As far as how do we know that um, it's safe, I think that since December, honestly, we've had a process that we, we've never seen in U.S. history is that we have this Be Safe program where everybody's registered, everybody can report their side effects or anything that is happening. So we know in real time when something may be wrong and that we have to do something different. And so far, the information that we're getting from the millions of doses that have been uh, given is that um, besides the minor side effects and the rare cases of serious side effects, the vaccines are safe and seem to be working. Uh, our next question, are the vaccines effective for those who have already had COVID or have lasting health issues from COVID? Yeah, so COVID-19, after you've had the, um, the infection yourself, we're not sure how long that immunity that you got from your infection lasts. So you are at risk for getting reinfected again. So even if you had COVID-19 in the past, we really recommend that you make sure that you get the vaccine again to prevent you from getting reinfected. Unfortunately, that's the, the million dollar question is how long does it last? And we're not sure yet. Um, you know, unfortunately, from the data, we're still following all the patients and people that have received the vaccines to determine how long it lasts, but we're not sure. And, you know, for the people that have had um, those long-term or long long-term side effects or symptoms of COVID, it actually seems like the vaccine is helping them. Um, people are reporting that they feel less out of breath, they, le they have less coughing. Um, there are more studies that are being done to really understand why the vaccine is helping people with the long-term side effects. Um, so it's not quite clear yet, but we're already getting reports from those patients saying that they feel better after the vaccine. Um, how long should someone wait after testing positive for COVID-19 to get any vaccine? Right. So if you test positive and you have symptoms, you have to wait until you feel better, right? So you no longer have any symptoms, you're fine, then you can start, you know, looking at getting the vaccine again. If you test positive and you don't have any symptoms, you just have to wait for your isolation. So as you know, if you test positive, you have to isolate for 10 days. So once that's done and there's no symptoms, you can still you can go ahead and, and get your vaccine. Um, can you get the vaccine while you're pregnant? Yes, um, we actually recommend that pregnant um, women get the vaccine. Um, pregnant women are higher risk for severe COVID disease, meaning that they end up in the ICU, they need to have a respirator and potentially death um, because of their condition. So it's even more important for them to be protected. I know that there's a lot of concern or question about whether or not it's safe um, for uh, pregnancies. And so far, uh, based on the way the vaccines work and um, over 30,000 pregnant women that have received the vaccine, the data seems to show that um, the vaccine is safe for pregnant women. So right now we, we do recommend that pregnant women get the vaccine. 
Very good. Very good. Thank you. Um, what about getting the vaccine if you're breastfeeding? Similarly, um, we don't have exact information on how the vaccine works if you're breastfeeding, but again, based on the way that the vaccine acts in the body, we do not have any concerns with breastfeeding. We do not um, believe that it will be passed on to the baby um, that is breastfeeding. So for now, again, because the, um, the risk of the COVID infection is high, we recommend that people that are breastfeeding are, um, get the vaccine as well. Um. Let's see, now that the vaccine has been cleared for kids 12 and older, uh, what should parents know and why is it important for kids at this age to be vaccinated? Yeah, that, that was a very good excitement this week. Um, so I think that in all this pandemic across the world, we've really heard about the adults unfortunately getting really sick and ending up in the ICU. And some, somehow the, the teenagers have kind of been forgotten. And that, that unfortunately doesn't mean that they were not getting infected and they weren't getting sick. You know, just in California, we had, I think, almost half a million uh, teenagers, you know, in that less than 17-year-old range that, we, that had COVID-19. So it's not insignificant. So they are also at risk and they need help. Um, the other big reason why I think it's important for the teenagers or the, 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 the children to be um, vaccinated is because they can hopefully get back to some kind of normal activities. You know, they've been cooped up like the rest of us and maybe even more so than the rest of us. So it's definitely an opportunity for them to finally look forward to some kind of return to normalcy. So I think for me, that, those would be the two biggest reasons to say, you know, you should consider having your, your children, uh, if eligible, to be vaccinated. So things to know is um, the side effects are going to be very similar to adults. Um, most likely with the second dose, people are going to have a um, higher reaction. Um, you should know that if they, the, your children are behind on the other vaccines, you can give them at the same time. Uh, there used to be a recommendation where you had to wait 14 days in between the vaccines, but now um, you know, uh, the CDC, um, the uh, American Academy of uh, Pediatricians says, you know, don't wait, just do it at the same time. CDPH, the county uh, Department of Public Health says the same thing. So um, you can do it at the same time. Um, you should accompany your children to get the vaccine. If unfortunately you're not able, you're not able to accompany them, make sure that you sign a consent form so that, you know, it's, we know that it's okay for the children to receive the vaccine. And um, I think I think those are the main points to know. Um, the safety and efficacy seems to be the same as for adults, so we're really hoping that this is going to help our children. That's great, and it's it's great that they're able to get um, all of their vaccines, especially for school at the same time, makes it easier for for um, their parents or guardians. Definitely, especially because of the pandemic, you know, many of us kind of delayed some of those vaccine appointments because we were wanting to isolate or stay home. So this is an opportunity to kind of do it all at once. So um, just to piggyback on that, are there any existing conditions that suggest that uh, children shouldn't receive the vaccine? Not, not at this time, nothing different than what, with, what we see with adults. So. Um, I'm sure you all heard uh, the people that really should not be looking at uh, getting the COVID-19 vaccine are those that have had severe allergic reaction. They sometimes call anaphylaxis, where you have difficulty breathing, your throat is closing up. Um, you know, should not if you've had those kind of reaction, especially to a, another type of vaccine in the past, or any if, even you know to another injectable medication, so another shot or another IV. You know, you're usually not a candidate for vaccine. Um, also, people that have had, um, you know, right after their first dose, for example, they've had an allergic reaction. Usually we say, okay, you're not going to get the second dose. But other than that, um, you know, besides the allergic reaction, there are no conditions that our children may have, and we say, no, you're not eligible for the vaccine at this time. Um, so uh, another question that gets asked a lot um, probably over the last six or seven months or so, uh, it has to do with the variants. Will these existing vaccines help out with the new variants? 
Yeah, so, so far it seems like it. Um, so the variants, are, again, I'm sure we've all heard in the news, um, seems to cause COVID-19 to spread faster, quicker. Sometimes, you know, uh, the cases are milder than the original one, and it seems like people that are vaccinated with the COVID-19 vaccines are less likely to get um, uh, sick from the variant. So, so far the vaccines are working against the variants. More more um, studies are being done specifically for the variants, but so far from based on the information we have, it seems to be working. Um, so for someone who has had reactions to the flu vaccine, is this vaccine safe for them? It depends. So as I mentioned earlier, if the, the reaction to the flu vaccine was allergic reaction, most likely not, but there should be a conversation with your physician um, to discuss your particular case. Um, if, uh, if it was maybe a stomach upset, I think that should be fine. But again, you should have that, that conversation with your physician before you decide to take the vaccine or not. The, the key point is that severe allergic reaction um, you know, with, a, with a vac another vaccine like the flu vaccine or another kind of IV medication. And uh, what about um, uh, the chance of someone who has received, has, has received the vaccine uh, spreading COVID-19 to family and, and other loved ones? Yeah, now that more people are vaccinated, it, sound, it seems like, um, based on the information we have, that it's, the vaccine is helping reduce the transmission. So if I'm vaccinated, I'm less likely to transmit it to somebody else. But again, I'm, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but nothing is set in stone. We still are looking at information. We're still gathering information. But for now, um, you know, a few months ago, I was going to tell you we don't know, but now it seems like it. And hopefully in the next few months, as more people get vaccinated, we get more information, we'll have even a better answer. But so far, it seems like it's, it's helping um, keep people from spreading the, 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 the COVID-19. And, and is there anyone that you can tell us about who should not, who should definitely not get the vaccine? Yeah, again, the um, severe allergic reaction. If you've had a vaccine before, flu vaccine, Tdap, any type of other vaccines that we routinely get and you've had that severe allergic reaction, you're probably not a candidate um, for it. If you've had um, uh, allergic reaction to things like Miralax or you had a colonoscopy and they gave you a big bottle of, of medication to drink, that type of medication, you're probably not a, um, a candidate for the Pfizer Moderna vaccine. Um, so it's really about uh, the allergic reaction. If you've had an allergic reaction after the first dose of the vaccine, you probably should not get the second dose of vaccine. So I highly re recommend that if you've had any kind of allergic reaction like that, to discuss with your physician first, and then the, together you guys can make a decision. And is there any particular vaccine, Moderna, Pfizer, or Johnson & Johnson, uh, that you recommend, or are, are all three of them good options? Honestly, they're, they're all, all good options. I know that Johnson & Johnson was just in the news. Um, there was a lot of concern with that. And, you know, they came back and said, based on the information that we have, if you are a woman uh, uh, younger than 50 years old, you may have a risk, or you, so you may want to look at something else. Um, so I would say that if you're a man, all three of them are, are, are a good option. If you're a woman under the age of 50, you may want to have a discussion with your physician, and you may want to go with Pfizer or Moderna. If you're an older woman, all, all good options at, based on the information we have at this point. Uh, so should people be concerned about the Johnson & Johnson? You just uh, spoke about uh, some issues they just had. Should they be concerned about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, after it was in the news recently, or has everything worked out? Yeah, I think it kind of got resolved in a sense. And if I can kind of give some background, um, because this is such a high visibility situation and we want to make sure that people are safe with these vaccines, the moment that there's a spike in particular side effects where we're seeing the concern, the regulatory agencies like the FDA, the CDC, or you know the California Department of Public Health, they're going to do the right thing and say, why don't we stop, see what's happening, and then determine if it's safe. And I know that causes a lot of con concern, but to me, it actually means that the system that they put in place is working. They truly are looking out for us, and that's why they, they, they're doing this out of the abundance of caution. 
So what they ended up doing is they reviewed the information and, you know, there was um, this link identified between the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and this condition called TTS, meaning people have clots in their brain or, or, and they have low platelet count, meaning they, they can uh, bleed easily. So they identified that um, it was about seven out of a million, one million doses identified, uh, uh, one million doses administered that um, had this TTS condition. Um, they didn't think that it was significant enough, it's rare enough that they felt that it was safe for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine to resume, uh, to, to resume to be given to people. So a couple of weeks ago, they said, go ahead, please continue to, to give the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. They did say that for women over, uh, under the age of 50, so younger women, you may be at risk for that TTS, which is rare, but you may be at risk and you should be aware. If you are concerned, you should look at Pfizer and Moderna for your vaccine moving forward. So I, I, you know, I know this very concerning and there's that rare risk and thankfully we have options so that you can go to the other two vaccines if you, we don't feel comfortable for the Johnson & Johnson. But the good thing is that we know that men can use any of those vaccines without any concern and older women as well. Very good. So um, once someone has been vaccinated, how long is that their particular vaccine effective? And is there a possibility that we'll need to receive vaccines every year like we do with the flu shots? Yeah, to answer the first question, fortunately is that we don't know yet um, as how long would the vaccine last? And that's why the, the, the vaccine manufacturers continue to monitor patients that have been um, vaccinated to figure out is it nine months, six months, 12 months, how long until you, know, you no longer have that immunity. So unfortunately right now we don't know and that's why even though there's been some relaxation about the masking policies, we're still asking everybody to be careful and not to, you know, to, to get, put themselves in, in jeopardy. Um, as far as the, what we call the booster shots, it's uh, possible. Uh, if you take the example of the flu, the flu virus, every year it mutates, it changes. That's why we have the COVID-19 variants you talked about earlier. So it's possible that to adapt to those variants as they develop, we may need uh, a yearly shot. But again, it's unfortunately too early to tell, and only you know more time and patience will let us know. And um, what can people? Uh, safely look forward to after they're fully vaccinated? What does it mean when you're fully vaccinated? Yeah, that, that, that's that been the, the one of the greatest news. We keep seeing, you know, an, uh, announcements about that. So first, um, fully vaccinated means you receive both doses of Pfizer and Moderna and you waited two weeks after the, the second dose or you receive the Johnson & Johnson single shot and you waited two weeks after that. So it's after two, two weeks after you completed the vaccine that you consider fully vaccinated, not before. So I wanna make sure that everybody is aware that you need to wait those two weeks to consider yourself fully vaccinated. And the new guidance from the CDC is that you can now meet up at home or in a closed environment, indoor environment with other people that have been vaccinated. You can even meet up with unvaccinated people as long as they're all from the same house, right? So if you go and visit your relative, they all live together and they all decided they, don't, they didn't want to um, be vaccinated, you can do that. And you don't have to wear masks or physical or do the social distancing with them. Um, you can go for a walk or, or you know, or run outside um, it, without a mask if you've been fully vaccinated. So you, you're starting to um, kind of go back to normal. I do want to caution us to not get too excited. Um, let's not go to outdoor concerts or indoor concerts without a mask. We still can't go to the mall without a mask, even, even if you're fully vaccinated. So it's kind of a balance, but it's a step in the right direction. And um, hopefully pretty soon we can go back to normal. Very exciting. I, I'm sure everybody would love to get back to some kind of normal. So that's exciting news. Definitely. Well, you know, now we're going to take some uh, audience questions uh, that we've received in the chat. And if anyone wants to ask a question, um, please use the raise your hand feature uh, that you'll see by clicking the reactions button on the right hand bottom of the screen. And uh, then I'll, uh, we'll select um, each person in, um, that I can see with their hand raised. Uh, let's see. I see two hand, hands raised. Um, let's go there. 
All right, let's go to uh, Dahlia first. Dahlia, you're up. What's your question? Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, so I uh, was wondering, I have a friend who just uh, received his shot and he actually ended up getting COVID from the shot. So mm -hmm. I understand there's breakthrough cases and mm -hmm. the CDC is now um, transitioning how they report that data. So can you talk a little bit about the breakthrough cases where yeah. people actually get COVID from the shot? Definitely. Uh, I want to clarify that the, the COVID is not um, occurring from the shot. So the clarification that I made about the, waiting the two weeks to be considered fully vaccinated is really important because in between the two shots of Pfizer and Moderna or right after your shot of single, uh, your single shot of Johnson & Johnson, you may get COVID, unfortunately, because you're not yet at that fully vaccinated. But I want to clarify that it's not um, the COVID, uh, the COVID vaccine is not giving the people the COVID uh, disease, right? So there's nothing in the vaccines, any of the three vaccines that can make somebody have COVID-19 disease itself. It's unfortunate, it's just that, you know, the timing between when they may have been exposed to the COVID-19, somebody with COVID-19, and when they received their the, the vaccine is when they had those kind of breakthrough cases. I hope that helps, Delia. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you, Delia. Uh, Julius has a question. Julius, go ahead. Um, my concern is I, I want to get the vaccine done but I'm afraid because I have a large heart and I have congested heart failure. So I don't know if it, I don't know if it would affect me or not. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And, and I wanna make sure that you check in with your physician because he knows or she, he or she knows you well and they know um, your surrounding factors. But you know, because of what you shared, I would say that if you were to get the, the disease, you would probably be at a higher risk for this most severe disease. So I definitely encourage you to please talk to your physician and discuss whether or not you'll be eligible, how it may impact you in a negative or positive way, and then you know, make that decision with your physician, okay? Please do not delay having at least the conversation. If together you decide that the vaccine is not for you, at least you know and you continue to protect yourself by using masks and doing social distancing. But if you determine that it's for you, then you, you um, reduce any delays in you getting vaccinated and, safe, and be safer. Thank you, Julia. Well, Thank you. Someone in the chat has asked, what about wearing a mask outside? Yeah, so as I mentioned, if you're going to be doing um, walking, running, you know, going from one place to the other outside, you don't, you, if you're fully vaccinated, as I, as I mentioned earlier, you can do so without um, wearing a mask. However, please, you know, if you're going to go to like an outdoor concert or, you know, a festival or something, make sure you wear your mask because even though you're outdoor, you have so many other people out, uh, you know, surrounding you, you still have to be careful. But if you're with your family and everybody's vaccinated, you guys are just walking or going for a run or, you know, playing sports together, it should be fine to not wear your uh, mask based on the new CDC guidance. Okay, Ingrid. Ingrid has a question. Go ahead, Ingrid. Ingrid? Uh, let's see. Sí, buenas tardes. Mi pregunta es, mi niña va al 8 y al 9, una de 13 y una de 15. ¿Es obligatorio que se pongan la vacuna que se ha aprobado para ellos para la escuela? ¿Es ley? Por su pregunta. So she's asking if kids will be required to get the vaccine, kids who are over 12 years old, in order to attend school. That's a great question. Um, right now, there's no requirement of making the vaccine mandatory for anybody, kids or or adults. Um, I think that everybody understands that this is a personal choice, this is in a unique situation. It's unlike the other vaccines where 
Um, you know, parents are required to fill out a form and show Im uh, immunization vaccine records. Um, this one is a little bit different. Um, the state of California is still looking at what would, what would the new year look like, but at this time, there's no indication that they'll make this vaccine uh, required for people to for kids to attend the school. Thank you, Ingrid. Uh, Dahlia, you're up again. Dahlia. Awesome, thank you. Um, so I just had another question because it's technically not FDA approved and it's my understanding that they skip uh, like the part that was kind of missing is the animal trials got skipped for the mRNA. So can you guys touch on kind of some of the previous research that was done regarding mRNA trials? Sure. So mRNA actually is not something new. It may be new as a type of uh, delivery of a vaccine to our body, but it's not something new. mRNA has been studied for decades. And um, there are animal studies, and even when we're talking about the safety of the mRNA vaccines in um, pregnancy or breastfeeding, it's based on animal studies and, you know, the information that we gathered from that. And though um, the uh, Pfizer, Moderna, or Johnson & Johnson are not technically FDA approved, they have that emergency use authorization. And Pfizer is actually already looking at getting f uh, full F FDA approval for their vaccine. So I, I know there's a lot of concern about the MI vaccine and how they may impact our genetics and our bodies, but we do have information about how um, mRNA interacts with our body, with our DNA, and so on and so forth. And, and that's usually from, you know, not just, um, you know, research in a test tube, but also animal research. I hope that helps. Yeah, just one more note on that, because I was reading some research where during this testing that the animals didn't survive. So I guess that's kind of my concern. Is there some long term things that we may not know of? And since that's why it's not FDA approved yet. No, um, it's not that it's not FDA. It's not that it's not because we don't know if people are going to survive long term or not that it's not FDA approved. It's again because of the situation that we are in, and it's a um, national or international emergency. So the, what the FDA is doing is that they're looking at data based on clinical trials that were performed. It may not have been clinical trials, you know, that included. 30,000, 40,000 people, but it was sufficient size to say, okay, this is safe and effective and it's going to help. And that's why they're already moving towards giving full approval um, of those vaccines. So I want to make sure that, you know, we, we that I, I convey that um, steps were not skipped in this particular process because we want to make sure that everybody is safe. And that's why there's also that monitoring after the people have gotten the vaccine to continue to confirm that what we saw in the clinical trials with those medications or with those vaccines is still what we're seeing in the general public. And so far it seems like it is. Have, have you observed anything in the data about, um, I, I think women having disrupted menstrual cycles? I have not uh, personally seen that information. I know that people can have different side effects. The majority is what we all know is the, you know, the pain, uh, the headaches, you know, the, the swollen lymph node, and so on and so forth. But I'm sure if we dig further, maybe we see that information, but I have not seen that personally myself yet. Thank you. Uh, Thank we you. For that, Professor Hammond. I'm sorry, can you say that again, Deborah? Sebastian? Oh. Hola, buenas tardes. Eh, yo quería hacer una pregunta. Eh, estos últimos días hemos escuchado de las autoridades eh, estadales, creo que del gobernador específicamente, que iba a levantar el uso obligatorio de la máscara en algunos sitios cerrados. A mí realmente eso me preocupa porque tengo entendido que todavía hay muchas personas que no se han vacunado. Y si bien es cierto que no sabemos identificarlas, yo temo mucho todavía tener contacto y más en espacios cerrados que todavía desconozco si las personas están vacunadas o no. ¿Qué de cierto es? ¿Qué garantía tiene uno quitarse la máscara en lugares cerrados con personas que estén también sin máscara y que uno no se contagie? Porque dicen que los vacunados 
que no, no deberían de usar, que está según los estudios, que los vacunados deberían usar, no usar más, estar en lugares cerrados porque no tienen riesgo a no contagiarse. ¿Qué de cierto es eso? Si es garantía o no. Gracias por su pregunta. So she's asking with the new mandate that masks will not be required, what are the chances that someone who's been vaccinated but isn't wearing a mask, what are the chances that they won't contract COVID? Great question. It depends on the setting. So if they are sticking to the current guidance of just being outdoor kind of with their own family or themselves and walking and not in crowded space, the chance of getting COVID-19 vaccine should be low even if you're not masking. Now, if you're going to like an indoor club or, or a mall where there's a lot of people, even if you're vaccinated and you don't use your mask, then that's when the risk is really high, right? So that's why the, the CDC is very careful and they, they make sure that when we are gonna be indoors, we're only gonna be indoors with people that are, um, that are fully vaccinated or, pe or only a small one house of people that are not vaccinated. The moment that you are um, interacting with two or three people living in two different places together and they're not vaccinated, the CDC says, put on your mask again, okay? So if you stick to the, what the CDC is recommending, there should be a low risk of getting the COVID-19 if you take off your mask as they recommend. And, and I do wanna say personally, I think that it's also a personal choice. Um, if you would like to continue to wear your mask, even outdoors while you're walking, running, or walking your dog, please feel free to do so and continue social distancing. Thank you, Thank you Sebastian. Uh, we'll take a question from the chat and then I'll go back to raise hands. In the chat, someone has asked, is it true that the Pfizer vaccine has side effects on women who suffer from PMS? Yes, similar to a question with Delhi, I have not seen that yet. I'll go back and double check the, the research, but I have not personally seen that information yet and I'll see if it, that exists. But unfortunately, I'm not aware at this time. Thank you. Okay, uh, Wendy, you're up. What's your question? Hi, yes. So I know that they're um, saying that it's safe for pregnant and breastfeeding women to um, get vaccinated. I'm currently breastfeeding. But I just know that there wasn't any trials done on pregnant and breastfeeding women. So just um, how, um, like, how do you know it's like safe for breastfeeding and pregnant women if there if the trials didn't include um, both uh, those categories? Yeah, good, good question, Wendy. So for the pregnancy, there were some um, trials in animals, and I, I know you know we're gonna say we're not animals, but um, you know animals trial uh, determined that. The, uh, the vaccine, especially the mRNA vaccines are safe for um, people that are, for animals that are pregnant. And so far there were over 30,000 women that were pregnant that received the vaccine that the, um, the CDC and FDA and the manufacturers are following. And they, you know, they're following them at the trimester. They, they follow them after they gave birth to see how the, 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 child, uh, the, the childbirth went and how the infant is doing. And so far there have no been uh, not been any kind of serious side effects or any any adverse event to the to the baby. So even though we don't have specifically tri specific trials um, in pregnancy, with the information we have and the way the vaccines work and how they they react in our bodies, there is some level of confidence there that it doesn't affect the pregnancy. And that's similar with the breastfeeding. They are trying to do some trials right now. We with women that are breastfeeding, but um, the, the way that the vaccine works, it doesn't seem to be going through the um, breast milk and getting to the infant. And that's why there's that belief that they're safe right now for, the, uh, for anybody that's breastfeeding. Okay, I hope that you. helps, Wendy. Yes, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Ingrid. Ingrid, what's your question? ¿Cuál sería el lugar recomendado para llevar a nuestros hijos a ponerse su vacuna? O si en el, en el chat pueden poner el website para hacer cita o si es necesario hacer cita para llevarlos a, a su vacuna. Gracias por su pregunta. Um, so she's asking, where is the best place to take your child to get vaccinated? Oh, 
Good question. Um, if you go to my turn, um, the website that the uh, state of California made available, you can put in your zip code and um, identify any places. Uh, you know, any of those places uh, is, is adequate to get your child vaccinated. If you also prefer, you can contact your child's pediatrician. Um, the state of California has really done a great job in making sure that the vaccine, now that it's open to children, the vaccine is available at the pediatrician's office or um, nearby, you know, clinic so that you can have that given. But honestly, any place that is listed on the MyTurn website would be adequate to have your child um, vaccinated. Muchísimas gracias por la información. Delia, you're up again. Delia. Thank you. So, um, is the vaccine adverse event reporting page system a good resource to see what reactions people might be having to the vaccines? Because sure. Yeah, please okay. go ahead. Okay, because I, with the whole breastfeeding question, I did see one report on breastfeeding. So I was just wondering if that's something you had, had seen there or sure. if that data and, is and not. I, that, that's a great kind of way to for me to highlight a few things. So we have given over 220 million doses, I believe. Um, not 220 million people, 220 million doses in the United States. And you kind of have to look at everybody is different. And if you see one report out of 220 million, it kind of speaks to you, is, is this something that is actually a problem or it may have been uh, something that is specific to that person and so on and so forth. And that's why, that, that's, you know, what um, the CDC did with the, with the Johnson & Johnson in the cases of TTS I, I mentioned earlier, is looking at what are the reactions we've been reported, what is the prevalence of, you know, how frequent is this being seen to determine is this really a problem or is it a case-by-case -case basis and something that we can continue to watch. But I definitely encourage you guys to continue to, you know, review the CDC website, the FDA website, um, Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson website. Yeah, they have been very transparent about adverse events and, you know, risk precautions, anything they have at, at this time as far as the vaccine. All right, thank Please. you. Sure. Are there any other questions for Dr. Yumi? Okay. Um, I have a question. Um, is it is are there many studies about the vaccine? I I just heard that twelve year olds um, are able to receive the vaccine. So I want to know what the background on the research is on being able for the kids to get the vaccine. Twelve years old. Yeah. So um, there were studies that were done in um, thousands of children comparing children that received the vaccine, that were willing to receive the vaccine during that research study, and the children that did not receive the vaccine. And um, the, the, those studies were meant to determine whether or not the vaccine was effective in preventing the COVID disease in, in children, but also what kind of side effects that could be expected in that age range. And after that trial, that's when um, Pfizer requested um, review by the FDA and the FDA based based on that information, determined that it would be safe and effective for the children to get it. Um, so it's based on that research of those, I think it was almost 4,000 uh, 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 children that were involved in that research study that they decided, yes, at this time it's safe to uh, involve the children and get them vaccinated as well. Okay, thank you. Of course. Do we have any other questions for Dr. <laughs> Yo tengo una pregunta. Go ahead. Ok. Si tienen algún conocimiento de algún lugar que esté colocando la vacuna Johnson Johnson. Do you know of any location that is administering the Johnson Johnson vaccine? I know that Cedar sinai um, sometimes gets uh, some Johnson & Johnson vaccine and they may have some of those available, 
but unfortunately, on top of my head, I wouldn't know um, outside of Cedar sinai I really recommend um, going to the My Turn California website and then seeing who's around you. And you can give them a call and see, you know, if they have the Johnson & Johnson versus oh, which okay. other vaccines they may have. Okay. okay. And we have a little bit of additional information to add to what you just said, Dr. Yumbi, about locations where people can look for, for information. We'll get that to that momentarily. Thank you. Are there any other questions for the doctor? And, and Carolyn from, from our Cedar sinai actually team is letting me know that my turn actually tells you which uh, vaccine is available at which site. So definitely go to that website. Thank you, Carolyn. So, Dr. Yumi, thank you so much for joining us today and answering all of our questions. We so appreciate your time and your expertise. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me back, and I hope I was helpful. Very, very helpful. I think folks are very pleased. Thank you. So, um, uh, just as I was saying, here's a little bit more information on how to access the vaccine. The Department of Public Health has multiple locations around Los Angeles with appointments available. You can also schedule an appointment at the, at the location of your choice on their website. Um, as you can see here, in order to be vaccinated, you'll need to show a photo ID and proof that you're, well, I guess now it's uh, 12 years and older. Uh, and you don't need to show government issued ID and you don't need to be a US citizen to, be, to get a vaccine, very, very important. Um, we also have local pharmacies like CVS, uh, Savon, Rite Aid, Walgreens. They're also offering free vaccines. And to find an appointment, just visit their websites to choose a date and time that's best for you. Uh, again, remember to bring ID. And uh, we're, putting, we're going to put in the chat uh, the website and phone number to call for additional information about the vaccines. Um, so there are lots of options and uh, some of them are probably very close to where you are. So please, please be sure to check out where you can get vaccinated. Um, so that's that. Uh, we're also, uh, well, let me also say that we're pleased to announce that uh, Children's Institute in Cedar sinai are partnering to offer vaccinations at some of our Children's Institute locations. Uh, we'll be able to share that exciting news and the locations um, very soon. So stay tuned. Uh, so before we wrap up, we're going to announce the winners of our $50 Target gift cards. And the three winners are Julius Jackson, Darla P., and Cecilia Perez, you are all $50 Target card winners. Congratulations. Yay. I think Target is also giving vaccines at their CVS, uh, their CVS locations within Target. So we'll just tie that all together right now. Anyway, winners, please send your email address to Children's Institute in the chat so that you can redeem your gift cards. Put your, your um, email address in the chat so that we can make sure you get your gift card right away. I think that is the end of our evening together. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope this information was valuable, that maybe if you were unsure, your mind was changed. That's hopeful. Um, have a great evening. We'll keep the chat open for a few, mi uh, few minutes to ensure that the winners have time to uh, enter their emails. But again, thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, we hope you have a wonderful evening. Bye. Thank you.